Methamphetamine. P. Pure. Speed. Meth. Sketch. Crank. Crystal. Ice. Glass. Go. Junk. Wake up. Zoom. Tweak. Chalk. Dope. Methamphetamine is a class A drug. My name's Nix and I was addicted to methamphetamine for four and a half years. Two thousand and one, and barely out of childhood herself, Nix is about to have a child. So I found out that I was pregnant at the age of fourteen. Me and the father, we ended up getting us a house, and so we had our own three-bedroom home at the age of fifteen. Obviously, both quit school, and he went and got a job at a timber mill in Whangarei to support us. And my role at the age of fifteen was to stay home and raise the baby. When Nix turned 18, she decided to leave her partner and Whangare for a change of scene. I sat down with my son's grandparents and I said to them, look, I want to go to Auckland, I want to start fresh. We decided that actually my son was kind of better off with the grandparents because they were able to provide and things like that. So, so we made the decision that he was going to stay with them while I went off into the world and, you know, experienced the world, so to speak. At the age of 21, well, I met a man, and I ended up getting married to him, and I ended up having three children to him. By the age of 26, we were living in Australia, in Perth. Our babies were three years old, two years old, and our, our youngest was 16 months old. And I mean, our marriage was, you know, it wasn't the best, but we, we stuck it out because we had made that decision to go to Australia as a whānau, and we really wanted to try to keep us as a whānau. Um, but there was a lot of arguing, um, so we decided to go our separate ways. So it was just me and the three babies for about three months, and then I went into the room one morning and I found our 16-month-old passed away. And it was at that moment, I pretty much died. That moment for any parent is unimaginable. The shock, the despair, the guilt. Nix's baby boy, Alaska, dead in his cot at 15 months. On this particular morning, I went in there um, and it was about eight o'clock. And I was thinking, ooh, he's having a big sleep, and the older two were already awake, and they were up on the table having breakfast. But I thought, no, no, I'll let him sleep in right to the very end, you know? So when I walked into the room, I grabbed his shoulder, and I, you know, gently went to go rock him. And as I rocked his shoulder, like, come on, baby, you know, wake up now. Um, his whole shoulder turned like that, and I could see his eyes open. Yeah, I fell on the ground, and you just have just this massive urge of shock going through your body. And the first call that I made was to their father. I couldn't even talk as well, and I could hear him, hey, what's, what's going, going on, what's, what's going, going on? on? And I said, it's Alaska. And he said, where, where is he, he? Where, where is he? he? And I, I just started crying, and I dropped the phone, and when I picked the phone up, I heard him saying, I'm on my way. And he was very angry, like he knew something was happening. It felt like one minute after I hung that phone up, um, their father comes storming in through that door. You know, he came in, he said, where's, where's my, my son? son? And I said to him, he's in his bed. I waited in the lounge and I heard his father go in there and I've, just, I've never heard a man scream like that. And then, he came out holding our son and saying, what, what the hell have you done? done? The police came in and then it was all surreal. There were detectives that were coming in through our lovely quiet home. You know, and you're sitting on the floor because it's just too much to process because, you, you know. I think I went straight to the liquor store uh, on that day and for the next few days, I was just hammered. I didn't want to acknowledge that he had passed away. And I remember my parents saying, you know, Nix, we need to have a conversation. And I know it's something you don't want to talk about, Nix, but you know, he needs a casket. And I'm like, 
oh my God, I don't even want to be a part of this. So alcohol was what I could get my hands on immediately. My other two children were with the father. I felt like my purpose was gone. So I went hard out on the alcohol. I don't really remember the funeral, to be honest. I just felt like such a failure, uh, failed marriage, you know, I couldn't even keep my first son. When Alaska died, I kind of felt like you know, it was my fault, kind of like if I hadn't have kicked his father out, um, then he might still be alive, you know. Just months before, we were a big family, um, and now at this funeral, you know, the casket's been taken down the driveway and I was the only one walking behind it. And at this point, her life totally unravels. A pivotal moment for me was sitting outside the liquor store waiting for it to open. And my kids had gone past on the daycare van and they beat the horn out to me. I ended up getting really smashed that day and um, being carried back inside. And when I came to, I thought to myself, I can't keep doing this. I needed to find something that would block everything out for me, but I could still function. I had a few people that I knew um, that did methamphetamine. And so I called upon these, um, these people that I knew and I said to them, I need, to, I need to get my hands on some of that stuff because um, I can't deal with what's going on at the moment. I do remember having that first puff and it was just like um, the slate was clean. I remember just everything melting off me. All the feelings of confusion and feelings of guilt just kind of slipped off me. And for the first time in a while, my mind was absolutely blank. After that, um, you know, the feelings started to wear off and in came creeping those thoughts again, the, um, the depression and, you know, all those questions. Um, and I thought to myself, no, man, I can't deal with this. I need to get some more of that stuff. I would get a little bit of money here and there and I'd be straight on that phone, can I, oh, can you come around and see me, can I grab some more? It was quite rapid, um, my decline actually, because I was now chasing this euphoric feeling of an absolutely clear head. And I would say it was in, you know, not many months after that, um, that I needed more and I needed more and I needed more than what I could afford um, because my my biggest fear now was coming down off the drugs and so within a few months I was selling my body for it. I thought to myself you know I've got my body here you know and there's people that want it and I need that money because I need to stay high pretty much started living out of hotel rooms, working nights and days. And then um, one of my clients that came to see me said, oh, why are you doing this? Why are you selling your body, you know? You should sell drugs. Coming up, Nix is hustling for the habit. I was out of it because I kind of weaned myself off from selling my body and I, I slowly started to get full time into hustling. Man, I remember being proud as of myself, like, you know, it's outrageous for me to think that now, but that was a huge accomplishment for me. I was really good at networking with all those, you know, all the top dealers um, from different ethnicities. And when I would go into these rooms with these scary, intimidating men, I was thinking to myself, no, nah, man, you can't threaten me because I'm not scared to die. Because if anything, you know, you're going to be doing me a favour because I don't even want to be here on Earth. I actually want to be passed away because I want 